Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Gallo. Uh, I'm here with Ann Bebo. We're both attorneys for the law firm uh, Van Dievener Black, and we'd like to welcome you to our presentation today. It's almost 420 in Virginia, what employers need to know about marijuana laws. Uh, Ann and I are members of the firm's uh, medical cannabis and hemp practice group, and we help businesses that are uh, involved in these types of fields that are, uh, as you, we will see and discuss, that are growing and growing uh, across uh, the Commonwealth and the nation. And um, at the end of this presentation, you will have our contact information. If you want to talk about this topic further, we'd be happy to help. Um, also, we're going to leave questions at the end. We're going to leave a few minutes for questions at the end. If you would just type your questions into the chat box and we'll have a look at them. We have uh, with us today, Kristen Fletcher and Jennifer Serrano. Thank you for their help in helping us with the questions and the slide deck today. And we'll also be distributing the PowerPoint at the end of the presentation as well, along with a link to our YouTube channel so you can watch this presentation later and some of our other content. Next slide, please. So this is a standard disclaimer that this is just general information. Next slide. So today uh, we're going to touch on four areas. We're going to discuss the current state of the law in Virginia uh, regarding marijuana. Um, we're going to talk about the progression of that law over the past few years and specifically focus on marijuana. And then we're going to discuss the most recent regulation legislation that was passed last month in the Virginia General Assembly. We'll follow that with a discussion of the current state of federal law on marijuana, and then finally with the discussion of marijuana in relation to employment, and, uh, and we'll be leading that discussion. And as I said before, we're going to leave some time for questions at the end of the presentation. Now, for the purposes of today's discussion, we're going to be primarily focusing on marijuana, but you may hear us use the terms cannabis, which generally, as you probably know, refers to the cannabis sativa plant from which marijuana comes. Hemp also, industrial hemp also comes from the cannabis plant, but that's not the focus of our discussion today. So we're probably going to be using the term cannabis and marijuana interchangeably, but for the purposes of our discussion, we're going to be focusing on marijuana. <clears throat> For, for decades, federal law didn't even differentiate between hemp and other cannabis plants. They were all effectively made illegal under the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act and formally made illegal in 1970 under the Controlled Substances Act. But I just wanted to put that out there. So when we talk about cannabis and marijuana for this presentation, we're talking about the same thing. So let's look back going back to 2015. In 2015, Virginia took its first limited steps allowing the use of cannabis by allowing the uh, use and possession of uh, cannabidiol oil, otherwise known as CBD, and tetrahydrocannabinol acid oils, or THC oils. But they were only allowed for certain conditions, such as intractable epilepsy. Now, at the end of my portion of the presentation, I'm going to be talking about CBD uh, briefly so we can distinguish between the two, but it's important to understand that CBD can be extracted from both hemp and marijuana. In 2016 and 17, Virginia expanded this by the establishment of five pharmaceutical processors that were allowed to dispense these oils. The processors were established in five health service areas. Next slide, please. Now, this is the current state of the pharmaceutical processors in Virginia. Health service area is open presently because the previous license holder, Pharmacan and later MedMed, had their license rescinded by the Board of Pharmacy. They intended to open in Staunton, but that did not happen. The Board of Pharmacy released a request for applications toward the end of last year, but uh, it's my understanding they have not selected the new pharmaceutical processor for that health service area. Uh, Dharma opened in Bristol in October 2020. Um, um, Greenleaf Medical opened in Richmond in November 2020. Delisto opened in Man Manassas in December of 2020. And Columbia Care opened in Portsmouth at the end of December. So those, those are now open. Those are pharmaceutical processors who are dispensing uh, the cannabis oils for registered, uh, registered individuals. Next slide, please. So Virginia expanded the medical use of these oils 
um, in 2018 and 2019. They expanded it to any diagnosed condition upon the certification of a physician. And in 2019, Virginia allowed nurse practitioners and physician assistants to issue certifications. It also expanded the availability of products such as lozenges, uh, topicals, lollipops. However, unlike some states with a medicinal marijuana program, uh, it did not allow and still does not allow smokable cannabis products. And it's important to understand that when we talk about these, we talk about them uh, patients being uh, registered and certified. Uh, physicians do not issue uh, uh, prescriptions for these because under federal law, marijuana is illegal. So it, when you hear them discuss, they are certifications and recommendations. They do not use the term um, uh, prescription. Next slide, please. So in July 2020, Virginia legalized the possession of these oils under certain conditions. Now that's important to note. Originally, these if you were caught in possession of these oils and you didn't have your certification with you, you could be arrested. But as an affirmative defense, you could bring to the court's attention that you were in fact certified and registered and allowed to possess the oils. But in July of 2020, um, Virginia legalized the possession of these oils, allowing a patient, a parent, a legal guardian, or a registered agent to legally possess it as long as they have a valid written certification from the practitioner and they are also registered with the Board of Pharmacy. Next slide, please. July of 2020 also saw Virginia decriminalize the simple possession of marijuana and simple possession means um, less than one ounce, uh, no more than one ounce of marijuana. As you can see, our state has made fairly rapid but incremental steps toward the legalization of marijuana. So again, July 2020, they did not legalize marijuana, they decriminalized it, which um, <clears throat> is a distinction. We're going to discuss that distinction coming up. So if someone is in possession of uh, um, simple possession of marijuana, it is a civil offense. It's a summable offense of $25 penalty. That's currently the state of the law. And there is a rebuttable presumption in the law that says if you're possessing no more than one ounce of marijuana, uh, it's for personal use. However, uh, the law also, uh, and Anne's going to talk a little bit more about this, employers are prohibited from requiring applicants, employees to disclose simple possession charges, arrests, or convictions. So that's the current state of the law right now. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk about the most recent legislation uh, that is that is uh, worked its way through the Virginia General Assembly. Uh, back in February of this year, two bills passed through the Virginia General Assembly, House Bill 2312 and Senate Bill 1406. These two bills developed out of the work performed by the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission and the Governor's Virginia Marijuana Legalization Work Group, both of which released their findings in November of last year. Now, neither report recommended the legal legalization of marijuana, but they considered the wide ranging issues surrounding legalization, such as taxation, banking, criminal justice reform, licensing regulations, and the required legislative changes to make legalization possible and consumer safety and recommendations on how to address those issues. Now, the Virginia General Assembly uh, came to a finalized bill at the end of last month, and it is now waiting for the governor's signature. Um, the governor could also propose amendments and send it back to the legislature, um, but right now it's waiting for action by the governor. Now there's a lot in this legislation, so we have limited time, so I'm going to touch on some of the major provisions. Next slide, please. If the pending legislation becomes law and it's not changed by some amendments, um, it would make Virginia the 16th state to legalize the recreational use of cannabis. Uh, the other states uh, in the United States range from full Ill illegality through comprehensive medical use and decriminalization, but the landscape is changing rapidly. Now, certain provisions of the pending legislation have to be reenacted in the next assembly uh, for them to become uh, law, such as the new criminal penalty sections and certain regulatory structures. But um, right now, as the legislation reads, it um, legalizes the simple possession 
of marijuana for those 21 years of age or older beginning January 1st, 2024. And it also permits retail sales January 21st, 2024. Um, it also requires the expung expungement of certain marijuana related offenses and also enhances penalties for other offenses. It establishes a regulatory scheme uh, for the cultivation, manufacture, testing, and retail sales of marijuana and marijuana products. That scheme is going to be developed by the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority and the Board of Directors. That, if the law stands, um, that will be created July 1st of this year. Uh, it sets up the licensing structure with licensing caps. Uh, and it allows the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority to control the licenses. It also allows the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority to start accepting applications for licenses beginning July 1st, 2023. And it also um, requires that authority to give preference to qualified social equity applicants. Um, the license caps as it stands right now are capped at uh, 400 retail marijuana stores, 25 marijuana wholesalers, 60 manufacturing facilities and 450 marijuana cultivation facilities if the law stays as it is. However, it does allow regulations from the control authority to reduce those numbers if, if they, they see fit. Um, it also limits vertical integration. Um, vertical integration meaning a license holder holding a license for a retail store, wholesaler, manufacturing, cultivation basically controlling the entire um, supply chain. It puts limits on that and those are those are laid out in the in the law regarding what those limits are. It, it also um, prohibits possession, consumption and sale in specified circumstances such as in public. Um, it also limits, it allows the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority to limit the allowable square footage of retail marijuana stores. Um, and <clears throat> it um, allows it to regulate other aspects of the sale, cultivation, and manufacturing of marijuana. Next slide, please. As far as cultivation is concerned, it legalizes the cultivation of marijuana throughout the Commonwealth in 2024. Uh, it permits home cultivation of up to four marijuana plants for personal use for those 21 years of age or older, and it also provides penalties if uh, there's home cultivation for more of those plants. And it also requires uh, licensure for marijuana cult cultivation and manufacturing, although not for personal home use, um, but, for, but for businesses who want to manufacture and cultivate uh, marijuana. Um, and it also prohibits the use of marijuana uh, in, a pub in a public place. Next slide, please. Now there is a very large set of economic provisions in the legislation. The legislation creates a cannabis equity reinvestment board and a cannabis equity reinvestment fund um, to, uh, to fund uh, business uh, businesses. It creates the cannabis equity business loan program and fund and the monies in the fund are to be used solely for the purposes of providing low interest and zero interest loans to social equity qualified cannabis licensees in order to foster business ownership in marijuana businesses and support economic growth in communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the former prohibition of cannabis. And the program provides loans to qualified social equity cannabis licensees for promoting business ownership and promoting ec economic growth. And those funds are in the Virginia Treasury. It also creates the uh, Cannabis Public Health Advisory Council. And the purpose of that, that, that council is to monitor public health issues and trends and impacts related to the use of marijuana and make recommendations um, regarding health warnings, uh, safety of marijuana products, composition of marijuana products, and related other issues. And it also establishes a taxation mechanism for marijuana and marijuana products and the dedication of those tax revenues. Uh, the taxation rate uh, is uh, at, at this point 21% uh, to be levied on sale of marijuana in the Commonwealth. And it also allows localities to levy an additional 3% tax on any sale uh, at, their at the locality level. Next slide, please. 
As far as sales are concerned, it does allow localities to prohibit retail marijuana sales by public referendum. Uh, it doesn't allow the, uh, doesn't allow localities to prohibit cultivation, but it does allow by public referendum in 2022 to uh, prohibit retail sales. Um, it also defines what edible marijuana pr products are. It does allow localities to fix the times of sale, but it does not abrogate the ability of localities to enforce local zoning ordinances or local business licensing regulations. So it gives some flexibility to localities uh, under certain conditions. It establishes the license, licensing procedures for retail marijuana stores. It also establishes labeling requirements for the sale of marijuana. Uh, it, it establishes uh, what's, what has to be on the label. It establishes testing requirements. Uh, it establishes licensure for testing as well. Now, one of the questions that's often asked is what is going to happen to the existing pharmaceutical processors under the medical cannabis uh, regulations under the Board of Pharmacy. Those are to remain in place. It grandfathers the existing pharmaceutical processors uh, for the license categories into the adult use market with some stipulations. It also continues to allow industrial hemp processors to continue to exist under the current regulatory framework uh, with the Virginia Department of Agriculture uh, and Consumer Services. So the, nothing is going to change immediately uh, with those particular businesses, but the regulations when they come out will be affecting them in a, in a couple of years, but right now they're going to continue to operate as they have. Next slide, please. So let's compare federal law to the legislation in Virginia. Under the Controlled Substances Act, marijuana is still illegal. Um, and it, the, it is a Schedule One drug. Uh, and it uh, it imposes penalties for unlawful manufacturing, distribution, and dispensing of controlled substances, and it places uh, marijuana in Schedule One because there is no con accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse and potential for addiction. And that's that's the current federal law as it is it is now. It has not changed. Next slide. So as I said, Schedule One examples are heroin. Uh, LSD and marijuana. Uh, no currently accepted medical use in treatment in the United States and a lack of lack of accepted safety for use. Now I'm going to talk about some pending legislation in the federal in the federal legislature right now, which may change things. But right now that is the state of the law with regard to marijuana. It's still considered a schedule one drug. Next slide, please. So. Um, Back in December of 2020, the United States House of Representatives passed the MORE Act, the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act. The purpose of the law was to remove cannabis from the list of scheduled substances under the Controlled Substances Act and to decriminalize the manufacture, distribution and possession of marijuana. It also creates various fund, uh, fund opportunities and it imposes taxes. That law, that particular piece of legislation rather, was um, went over to the Senate. It has not been brought up yet. Um, there is talk that it may be brought up with the change in administration and the change in the composition of the Senate, but right now uh, it, it has not been brought up for debate or a vote, um, but it did pass the House in December 2020. Uh, stay tuned for that to see what happens. Internationally, interestingly, recently, the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs which is the UN central drug making policy body uh, body voted to remove cannabis and cannabis related substances from its schedule uh, where it was listed along with opioids such as heroin. Now that doesn't legalize cannabis. Uh, it opens the door for further medical and scientific study of the drug at the international uh, level. So that's interesting. Movement is uh, is going uh, both internationally, nationally and at the state level. Now, before we move uh, further towards Anne's discussion of marijuana in the employment context, I wanted to go back and, and discuss THC versus CBD, since there's been a lot of discussion and news about CBD and other uh, cannabinoids over the past few years. And at the beginning of this presentation, I talked about cannabinoid oils and THCA oils. So um, I'm going to talk for about a minute or two on that before, before I turn the slides over to Anne. Next slide, please. 
So for those of you who are fans of organic chemistry, this slide is a, a graphic depiction of the difference between CBD and THC. Essentially, CBD is considered a non-intoxicating substance compared to THC. As I mentioned before, CBD can be extracted from both hemp and marijuana. Both have the same molecular structure. They have 21 carbon, 30 hydrogen, and two oxygen atoms, but they're arranged differently. CBD and THC are each one of over dozens of cannabinoids that have been identified in the cannabis plant. There's CBD, there's CBG, there's, there's many that are being uh, continued to be discovered. There's also hundreds of other non-cannabinoid compounds as well, but they are very close. They have the same molecular structure, but CBD is considered non-intoxicating as compared to THC. Next slide, please. So currently, there are no uh, other than the ones listed here, there are no other FDA approved drug products that contain CBD. The FDA did approve certain drugs, Epidiolex, Marinol and Syndros and Sesamet um, that have uh, CBD or a synthetic form of THC. Those are the only drugs that have been approved by the FDA that contain those the CBD. Under the FDA, it is still illegal to market any CBD product, either from hemp or marijuana, as having therapeutic benefits or as a dietary supplement unless the FDA has reviewed it and approved it. Now, Virginia does allow uh, the manufacture of CBD <clears throat> uh, for food products. Um, the manufacturing has to follow the regulations of the, the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, as well as the food and drug laws of the state of Virginia. So Virginia does allow uh, CBD products to be used in foods intended for human consumption, but the FDA does not. So you have a dichotomy there of what's going on. Um, I'm not talking about things like whole hemp seeds that you'll find in the supermarket. Those are generally what the, the FDA considers grass, generally recognized as safe. They actually don't contain really any CBD in them, um, but they are allowed to be sold in, in stores. FDA does not allow at this point, because drugs must generally either receive pre-market approval by the FDA through a new drug application process or to conform to a monograph for a particular drug category as established by the FDA's over-the-counter drug review, CBD was not a con an ingredient considered under that drug review and therefore it's considered a drug and any unapproved new drug cannot be distributed or sold in interstate commerce. So the FDA does not allow that to be sold in, in interstate commerce. Um, so there's a bit of confusion out there. There was a hope uh, a couple of months ago that the FDA was going to provide additional guidance with regard to CBD, uh, but they they came out with a statement uh, in February that that didn't really move the ball forward a lot, uh, uh, very much. A lot of people said um, they, they didn't develop any regulations yet. They're still studying it. So you can you can go to the FDA's website and and look at that for the latest information. But they're still studying CBD and what its effects are. So right now. This is the state of the law when it comes to the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, next slide. And I wanted to raise this because during the past several years, CBD products have become ubiquitous. Uh, and the FDA has issued numerous warning letters to companies who sell CBD products online for marketing. Uh, and making unsubstantiated health claims, among other issues. Uh, I think it's important to raise because when Ann discusses um, marijuana in the employment context, CBD is going to come up. But um, I think that's an important segue into Ann's presentation. So I'm now going to turn over the presentation to Ann to discuss marijuana in the employment context. Thanks, Jonathan. Next slide, please. So what does all this mean for employers? Well, the, the answer is hazy. You don't have to pardon the pun, but it's hard to avoid puns in this area. In fact, most people find it irresistible. So there is a tension between state law, which will soon allow, but not yet, um, marijuana, it'll soon legalize marijuana, and federal law, which currently prohibits marijuana. And then layered on top of that, you have an ADA affirmative, I'm sorry, the Americans with Disabilities analysis that you have to take a look at. And now Virginia has just amended its Human Rights Act um, 
disability uh, human rights act um, to allow for disability protection. And so that's another layer that we have to add to, on top of it. And right now, the analysis under that law is somewhat unknown because it's so new. So in short, there are no clear answers at this point as to how employers are to handle marijuana issues in the workplace. But what I'm going to do is I'm gonna walk you through the considerations um, that you should be looking at and show you how courts have been looking at this issue thus far. Um, you know, Jonathan talked a little bit about CBD, and one thing that I, I'd like to point out to you um, with regard to drug testing, because I think most businesses do drug testing now on their employers, your typical drug testing that employers administer on their employees reveals THC. It doesn't necessarily reveal if someone has taken CBD, but it might, because even if the CBD is derived from hemp, it may contain some THC. So the bottom line there is just that the drug testing is very imprecise. Um, even when the tests, um, some drug tests will just reveal whether the person has ingested cannabinoids, but it won't distinguish between THC and CBD. So sometimes the drug test results themselves are ambiguous. Um, also, the drug test will show whether the individual consumed THC within the last several weeks. It's not going to show you necessarily whether the individual is currently impaired, and that's usually what you're most interested in. So an employee who is using marijuana or is using CBD and is not currently impaired may still be entitled to an accommodation either under the Americans with Disabilities Act or under the Virginia Human Rights Act for their underlying medical condition. All this is going to depend on state law. And Jonathan's talked about um, this new legislation that we're expecting to be enacted shortly. And that's going to be key, but you'll notice one thing Jonathan didn't mention is any type of employment protection for cannabis use. Currently, the Virginia law that will legalize marijuana does not contain any employment protection, and that's very important. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that changed at some point, if the General Assembly went back and amended the law to address that, but the current state of the law, the law that's been um, passed by the General Assembly and we're waiting to have the governor sign does not contain any type of employment protection. As Jonathan mentioned, the law that was passed last year does have um, a really small clause that addresses employment, but all it says is that employers are prohibited from requiring applicants or employees to reveal if they have any past arrest charges or convictions for simple possession of marijuana, and simple possession is less than one ounce. But other than that, the law doesn't say anything about employment. So that's gonna be a key thing to think about as we go through um, the next few slides. So next slide, please. So the ADA is um, the main federal law that we're going to be, that we're gonna to have to keep our eye on as we're thinking about um, marijuana in the workplace. So the ADA applies to employers that have 15 or more employees. As I mentioned, the Virginia Human Rights Act was recently amended to include or expand disability protection under Virginia law. The only real distinction there is it would now um, cover employers who have as few as five employees will be covered by this Virginia equivalent of the ADA. Um, it's very similar to the ADA. It's written very similarly. It has the same type of considerations, except it doesn't address illegal drug use as the ADA does, which I'll mention in just a minute. So the federal ADA, prohibits employment decisions based on disability if the individual is qualified to perform the essential functions of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation. The ADA requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations to the employee's disabilities unless the accommodation would create an undue burden for the employer, and that's a fact-based analysis. Now, the ADA does have an exception for a disabled individual who poses a direct threat to the health and safety of others that can't be eliminated by a reasonable accommodation. And that might also play into this if you have an employee whose marijuana use um, impedes their ability to safely perform their job. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the ADA expressly states that anyone who is currently engaging in the illegal use of drugs is not a qualified individual with a disability. The new provision in the Virginia Human Rights Act that provides employment protection for people with disabilities doesn't address illegal drug use at all. It doesn't contain such a provision as you see in the federal ADA. So the federal ADA states that 
a qualified individual is not someone who's currently engaging in illegal drug use, but you can be a qualified individual with a disability if you've successfully completed a rehab program and you're no longer engaging in the illegal use of drugs, or if you're currently participating in a rehab program and you're no longer engaging in the use of drugs, or if you're regarded erroneously as someone who illegally uses drugs, um, which is kind of a strange thing for them to put in there, but it's in there. Um, interestingly, the EEOC guidance on the ADA and illegal drug use um, clarifies that someone who is a qualified individual because they used to use drugs and no longer use, use drugs, that's only true if the person was actually addicted in the past. So if the person just casually used drugs in the past and doesn't use them anymore, that um, past drug use is not a disability. It doesn't entitle them to any protection. It's only if they're a recovered addict that they have any protection under the ADA. Next slide, please. So what is current? Um, the, the law itself, the Americans with Disabilities Act itself, doesn't define current drug use. Um, the EEOC has issued guidance defining the term further, and according to the EEOC, current drug use is really a, a fact-based determination. It depends on whether the drug use occurred recently enough to justify the employer's reasonable belief that the drug use is an ongoing problem. Um, if the person tests positive for on a drug test, then it, the employer can consider him or her to be a current drug user. So the person doesn't have a protected status as being a recovered addict. The person is a current drug user, and that's outside the protection of the ADA. Um, current not use, not limited to the day of use or recent weeks or days, but it's determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Next slide, please. If a person has a disability under the ADA, the employer is required to engage in, in the interactive process with the person to determine whether or not an accommodation would allow the person to perform his or her essential job function. So the employer does have an affirmative duty under the ADA, and this is true under the Virginia Human Rights Act as well. There's an affirmative duty to engage in an, an informal interactive process with a disabled individual to identify the precise limitations and the potential accommodations. This only comes up if the person tells you that they have a medical issue that prevents them from performing their job. They have, and that's basically them asking for an accommodation. So they have to ask for an accommodation, but they don't have to ever specifically mention the ADA or the Virginia Human Rights Act. The employer can always ask for documentation about the disability, um, what, what the functional limitations are that the disability causes, and what aspect of the workplace is a barrier. And then the employer and the employee can talk about potential accommodations. The employee doesn't have to specify precise accommodation, and the employee also can't demand a specific accommodation. It's supposed to be an interactive process where there's you know, give and get on both sides. Next slide, please. So getting back to marijuana, how does this apply to marijuana? Well, the courts have been very consistent that the ADA does not protect illegal drug use and marijuana is illegal drug use, so there's no ADA protection for using marijuana. But you'll see in the, com in the next few slides I'll go through that courts split hairs on exactly what that means. And the first case, and it's still really the seminal case on this issue, comes from the Ninth Circuit, which is the Federal Court of Appeals that encompasses California and a few other Western states. And as I'm sure you're all aware, California was on the forefront of legalization, and they're one of the early states to legalize medical marijuana and then recreational marijuana. This case is um, almost, well, I guess it's nine years old now, um, James versus City of Costa Mesa from 2012 Ninth Circuit. And in this case, um, it actually was not an employment case. It came up under Title II of the ADA, which most people aren't very familiar with. Um, Title II of the ADA prohibits states and localities from discriminating on the basis of disability and the provision of public services. And in this case, the, um, there were two cities in California that had closed their medical marijuana facilities. And the plaintiffs in this case sued those cities saying, you're violating the ADA because we can't get access in our cities now to medical marijuana. And the court held that marijuana use under a doctor's supervision and in accordance with state law is not protected under the ADA because the ADA excludes illegal drug users from its definition of qualified individuals with a disability. 
It doesn't protect individuals who claim to face discrimination on the basis of their marijuana use. So medical marijuana may be legal under California law, but it's still illegal under the Federal Controlled Substances Act and under the ADA. Next slide, please. So that, as I said, was like really the first case, and you'll see it referenced in all the other cases um, that talk about marijuana use and whether it's protected under the ADA. Um, but I want to fast forward to a more recent case. This is EEOC versus Pines of Clarkston from the Eastern District of Michigan in 2015. And Michigan has a law that allows medical marijuana, and it, but it doesn't provide any um, employment protections. So this employee, Holden, was hired for a nursing job, and as part of her onboarding process, she was required to take a drug test. She disclosed, hey, I'm a medical marijuana user because I have epilepsy, um, but I'll take the test, but just know I'm going to um, fail because of the medical marijuana use. And the employer said, not a problem. This happens quite a bit. Go ahead and take the drug test. Well, she takes the drug test. She fails it for marijuana, as she had predicted, and the employer fired her. And she sued the employer, and interestingly, the EEOC joined in the suit, and um, which doesn't happen very often, but the EEOC joined in the suit, sued the employer, saying this is disability discrimination. And the employer argued, well, she failed the drug test, and the use of marijuana is illegal under the ADA. And the court held, yes, you're right, employer, discharge for illegal drug use is permissible under the ADA. It's, it's not a discrimination um, act and you're allowed to fire someone for using marijuana under the ADA. Um, nonetheless, there was still a factual issue, and this is kind of a, a tip for those of you who deal with ADA issues on a regular basis. The employer in the meet, meeting with the employee to terminate the employee talked a lot about her epilepsy. They also mentioned the drug testing, but they talked a lot about the epilepsy, and that created a factual issue as to whether the real reason she was fired was her epilepsy. So that issue was allowed to go forward, but the court dismissed her claim that she had been fired for medical marijuana use and said there's no ADA protection for that. Next slide, please. Um, this is a case from 2018 out of Connecticut, Knopfsinger versus SSC Niantic Operating Company. This is a federal contractor. Uh, the, the Connecticut has a law that allows medical marijuana and it does contain employment protection, which is that aspect I said we're not seeing currently in the Virginia law. So under the, um, the Connecticut law permitting medical marijuana, there's a provision that bars employers from firing or refusing to hire someone because of their medical marijuana use if they're using medical marijuana in compliance with the Connecticut law. So in this um, case, the employee during her job interview told the employer, I have PTSD and I, te I take medical marijuana. She got a job offer and they administer the drug test and predictably she failed it because of THC. And so the employer rescinded the job offer. The, um, the employee sued and the employer said, well, hey, we're just complying with the ADA and the ADA doesn't protect current drug users. And the court said, well, yeah, the ADA allows the employer to prohibit the use of illegal drugs at the workplace. But the ADA doesn't say anything that expressly allows an employer to prohibit drug use outside of the workplace. And that was a pretty surprising holding for the court to make. Um, but that was what this court in Connecticut um, held, that there's nothing in the ADA that allows you, employer, to prohibit an employee from using marijuana outside of the workplace. And the ADA, um, then the employer said, well, we have a performance standard, a qualification standard that someone has to be drug free to work here. And the ADA allows us to hold disabled people to the same standard as non-disabled people. And the court said, that's true. The ADA allows employers to hold an employee who um, engages in illegal drug use to the same qualification standards for employment that it holds others. But um, this is not a qualification standard. Drug testing is not a qualification standard. So that argument didn't work either. And the court held that ADA does not protect marijuana users on the basis of their marijuana use, but the Connecticut law does. Um, next slide, please. Then the employer said, well, we're a federal contractor. And as a federal contractor, we are required um, under the Drug Free Workplace Act to discriminate against people for their marijuana usage. And the court said, no, it doesn't say that. The Drug-Free Workplace Act does not require drug testing. 
nor does the Drug-Free Workplace Act prohibit federal contractors from employing someone who uses illegal drugs outside of the workplace, much less an employee who uses medical marijuana outside the workplace in accordance with a program approved by state law. That defendant has chosen to utilize a zero tolerance drug testing policy in order to maintain a drug-free work environment does not mean that this policy was actually required by federal law or required in order to obtain federal funding. So that's just kind of another interesting take on how um, these issues are viewed in states that do have employment protections. So in that case, the employer loses. Next slide, please. A more recent case, uh, Whitmire versus Walmart, this is from 2019 out of Arizona, and Arizona had a law similar to what we saw in Connecticut that prohibits employment discrimination based on um, someone's use of marijuana in accordance with state law. In that case, it was um, a registered qualifying patient's positive drug test for marijuana unless the employee used, possessed, or was impaired by marijuana at the work site or during work hours. And in this particular instance, the employee was a registered medical marijuana user in Arizona, and she said that she routinely smoked medical marijuana as a sleep aid and because she had chronic pain due to arthritis, but she claimed she never brought the marijuana into work and she was never impaired during work hours. She said she always took it before bed and by the next day she was um, sober and able to go to work. There was an accident at the work site. Um, basically some boxes fell on her um, while she was working and she had to take a post-accident drug test. And not surprisingly, she tested positive for marijuana. Um, the test revealed that she had marijuana metabolites at a quantitative value of greater than 1,000 nanograms per milliliter. And the employer decided that those test results indicated that she was impaired during her work shift and terminate her employment for violation of the drug policy. She then sued, alleging wrongful termination in violation of Arizona law, not under the ADA, but in violation of the Arizona law. And the court um, said, well, this is a, a real factual dispute, and we're going to need to see expert testimony on whether that amount of marijuana metabolites would indicate that the person was uh, impaired. And that's where the science is going right now, or rather, that's where the law is going right now in trying to determine in those states that have laws that provide employment protection, the question is going to be, is the person currently impaired and does your drug test reveal that? So that's going to be something for employers to consider once we um, start to have to address these issues. If Virginia ever does provide any type of employment protection for marijuana users, how are we going to determine if the person is actually impaired? Most of the drug tests that employers are using it, um, in work settings often don't reveal this level of detail. And then you're going to need an expert witness to explain whether or not the metabolites you're detecting indicate a current impairment. Next slide, please. Coates versus Dish Network is a case from Colorado, which again is um, like California, one of the states that was out the forefront of these issues, early um, legalization of medical marijuana, early legalization of recreational marijuana. And um, as early as 2014, they allowed medical marijuana. They also have a law, a kind of interesting law in Colorado, that makes it an unfair and discriminatory labor practice to discharge an employee based on the employee's lawful outside of work activities. And in this case, the employee was fired for testing positive for marijuana. And the employee filed suit saying, you violated this Colorado law that allows me to engage in lawful outside of work activities because I was only smoking marijuana at home during my non-work time and such use, my use of marijuana was completely lawful under Colorado law and therefore my activities were protected by Colorado law. And the court said no, which um, to me is a very surprising holding for Colorado, Colorado court. Um, the court said that even though medical marijuana use is lawful under Colorado law, it's still illegal under federal law. And so it's, it's not a lawful outside of work activity. Um, to me, this decision is very surprising, but it's still good law in Colorado. Um, so again, it just shows you that courts are looking at these issues in very surprising ways. Next slide, please. 
that's the Massachusetts case from 2017, Barbudo versus Advantage Sales and Marketing. Medical marijuana has, I'm sorry, Massachusetts had, has a medical marijuana law, but it does not provide for employment protection, just like the current um, Virginia law doesn't provide for employment protection. And in this case, there is an employee who took medical marijuana for Crohn's disease in accordance with the Massachusetts law and accepted a job offer that was contingent upon passing a drug test. And she told her new employer that she's gonna test positive for marijuana and the supervisor said, not a problem, go ahead and take the drug test. Um, and again, I, I'm always struck by how often I see these in the cases I look at where the employee tells the employer up front, I'm gonna test positive and the employer says, not a problem. And then the employee tests positive and gets fired. Um, um, anyway, it's kind of amusing. So the employee predictably um, failed the drug test and then she was immediately fired. And she filed suit arguing that, I'm sorry, she filed suit arguing that it was a violation of the ADA and Massachusetts law to terminate her employment. And the employer argued, we're just following federal law that prohibits marijuana. And the court said, well, the employee had a disability and under Massachusetts law, you had a duty to engage in the interactive process to determine if there was a reasonable accommodation that would help her perform her job. So that holding gives me some concern as to how Virginia courts are going to look at these issues if someone were to file suit under um, the Virginia Human Rights Act, which doesn't address illegal drug use, it just talks about accommodating disabilities. Would a Virginia court look at this the same way and say that, well, the person had a disability and so you had a duty to engage in the interactive process to determine if there was some reasonable accommodation that would help her perform her job. So what type of accommodation would that be? And in this case, the court insinuated that the employer should be looking into whether the employee could treat her condition with something other than medical marijuana. And that, that should have been the conversation that the employer had with the employee along the lines of, you can't use marijuana while you're working here. Is there some other medication your doctor could put you on that would treat your illness. Next slide, please. Okay, I mentioned earlier that the puns are really hard to avoid in this area, and I think everyone finds it just absolutely irresistible. In this case, Call Callahan versus Darlington Fabrics from Rhode Island in 2017, the judge just went whole hog with the um, puns. The start, he started the decision with a quote from um, Sergeant Peppers, I get high with a little help from my friends. And then it just went downhill from there and almost every page had another um, joke in it. Um, the, in this case, the employer had rejected a job applicant who was a registered medical marijuana user based on a pre-employment drug test. And the court wrote, to adequately perform its task, this court must wade into the weeds of the law of private rights of action, federal preemption, and statutory interpretation. Hopefully it will not write out of key or analyze out of tune. So obviously a huge vehicle fan. Rhode Island law prohibits employment discrimination on the basis of being a medical marijuana cardholder. And the employer argued, well, the federal law both the Controlled Substance Act and um, the ADA's provision against um, current illegal drug use, the federal law preempts the state law. And so regardless of the Rhode Island protection for medical marijuana cardholders, it's illegal under federal law. And so that trumps the state law. And the court said, well, yeah, it's kind of illegal under federal law, but not really. Um, the Congress has passed spending amendments that prevent funds being appropriated to the Justice Department to prevent states from Im implementing their own laws that authorize medical marijuana. So essentially, the federal government has basically a hands-off approach to states that have legalized marijuana. And the court said, based on that, eh, it's not really, really illegal under federal law anymore, which is a very questionable holding by the court, but that's what the court said. Um, and the court said, because of that, the, the employer was required to accommodate someone who was a medical marijuana use, and the employer did illegally discriminate against the plaintiff by firing her for testing positive for marijuana. Next slide, please. All right, and this is um, really the last case I'm gonna talk about. It's a New Jersey case um, from 2018, and this is interesting for how the legislature reacted to the decision. So New Jersey um, has a Compassionate Use Medical Marijuana Act that decriminalized medical marijuana. It, and initially it did not provide any employment protection. It just 
um, decriminalize medical marijuana. And the plaintiff in this case was a forklift operator. And there was an accident at work and the plaintiff was required to take a post-accident drug test. And again, he told his employer, I'm not going to pass because I take a bunch of medically prescribed drugs, including medical marijuana. And the employer said, that's okay. Take the test anyway. The, the employee flunks the test and the employer places him on an indefinite suspension and says, you can't work again until you can test negative for marijuana. So stay out until enough time has passed that the marijuana has cleared your system and then you can test negative and come back to work. Plan a filed suit claiming disability discrimination under the New Jersey disability discrimination law. And he argued that he could perform the job and he should not be required to take a drug test for marijuana. And the court held New Jersey law does not require private employers to waive drug tests for users of medical marijuana. Marijuana is still illegal under federal law. Next slide, please. So the following year, the New Jersey legis legislature came back and changed the law. They were upset with the way the court had handled that. And they basically added workplace protections for employees and healthcare practitioners who engage in activities that are authorized by their Compassionate Use Medical Cannabis Act. So now the New Jersey law prohibits employers from taking any adverse employment action against a medical marijuana user based solely on the employee's status as a registrant under the act. If the employee has a valid prescription for marijuana or CBD or any other um, substance that would be protected under that law, then the employer can't discriminate um, for use of that substance. After a positive drug test, the employer must allow the employee or applicant to present a legitimate medical explanation for the positive test result. So, you know, the conclusion is we still don't really know how courts are going to handle this in Virginia. Um, and it's something that we're all going to have to tread very carefully on and analyze these issues as they come up. Next slide, please. Okay, now we can take questions. Um, as you, If you move your mouse around the side of the screen, you'll see little bubbles um, with a question mark, and that's where questions will be posted. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and post them, and Jonathan and I will take them as we see them. Sure. We do have several questions, Anne. Um, okay. I, I can, I'll take the first one. Uh, sure. An anonymous question, what about possession for under 21 years of an ounce or less? So I'm not sure if that's a question on the current state or the, or the pending legislation, but I'll discuss both. So uh, currently, under uh, current law in, in Virginia, it's unlawful for any person to knowingly or intentionally possess marijuana, um, whatever your age. Um, and the penalty is a civil penalty of no more than $25. It's a summonsable offense. Uh, in the pending legislation, it, uh, it separates out. Uh, it basically says any person uh, over 18, but not yet 21, who, vi who violates the law and is in possession of it, is uh, going to receive a civil penalty of $25 in order to enter a substance abuse treatment or education program or both. A juvenile who, who possesses also will be subject to a civil penalty of no more than $25 in order to enter a substance abuse treatment or education program and the court would treat the ch child as uh, as delinquent. Uh, um, that's what the law currently says. Um, so that's the okay. answer to that. I'll take the next one. It's from David Campbell. Hi, David. Uh, his question is, given that the Drug-Free Workplace Act doesn't require drug testing and does not regulate drug use outside the workplace, and that usual drug testing does not establish current impairment and the pending legalization of marijuana in Virginia, should employers continue to test for marijuana post-offer pre-employment? I think that currently employers should continue to do the same drug testing that they've been doing all along. I think it's fine to continue doing drug testing for marijuana. And as David correctly pointed out, when you do drug testing um, at the new hire stage, you should wait till after you've made an offer of employment before you actually do the drug testing, conditional offer of employment. The, the problem isn't doing the drug testing. The problem is what you do with the information. Currently, um, it would be permissible to not hire someone um, for, not, for testing positive for marijuana, but as the law develops, it's something we're going to have to be very careful with. There may be situations where an employee is entitled to a reasonable accommodation for their medical condition, and if their medical condition is treated with marijuana, you may need to offer them a reasonable accommodation for that, and that will require you to try to figure out whether they're impaired or not. So um, 
there, again, there's just not a real good answer for that, but in terms of just a simple question of should we continue to test? Yeah, continue to test. The question is just gonna be, what do you do with that information when you get it? You wanna do the next one, Jonathan? Sure, these are all great questions, everybody. Um, the next one is from Joe, uh, talking about remembering when uh, marijuana was first legalized in the first states, there was a large debate and discussion over methods to test current impairment from cannabis, especially in the traffic stop situation to determine whether the driver is driving under the influence. Is there any method developed to test current impairment? Well, there are limited numbers of marijuana breathalyzers out there. I think Hound Labs makes one. There's a couple of other companies too. I don't know specifically what police departments are necessarily using them. The problem is, is while, you know, uh, we have a direct correlation to impairment with blood alcohol content, 0.08. It's a little bit more fuzzy with marijuana. Marijuana stays in your system longer, and th there's really not a huge direct correlation between the amount that's in your system and what equals impairment. And I know that legislatures have been grappling with that. Um, it used to be in the old days when I prosecuted uh, cases that I'd have to get a toxicology expert up on the stand because they did a blood test, and they would have to explain how the um, the marijuana uh, you know, left the system and how much was left and whether in their opinion, the person uh, was impaired based on the field sobriety tests. But there are some um, breathalyzers out there. Good question. I'll do the next one. This is another question from Joe. The Virginia decriminalization law includes the ban the box provision you mentioned, which prohibits employers from asking about simple marijuana convictions for job applicants. Does this law also prohibit employers from requiring the employee to disclose simple marijuana convictions during employment, does the law prohibit employers from asking these questions of internal applicants for promotions or another position with the employer? Um, the short answer is yes. So the Virginia law that um, Jonathan mentioned that was passed last year prohibits employers from asking applicants or employees about arrests, convictions, or charges of simple possession. So um, one thing you should do is take a look at your, where I often see this come up is on employment applications. And sometimes employers will have a question on the employment application. Have you ever been convicted of a crime? And what you should do is amend that to say, do not disclose convictions, arrests, or charges for simple possession of marijuana. Um, just put that expressly. And the same thing if you're doing internal um, promotions or you have an internal applicant with an existing, from an, from an existing applicant, from an existing employee who's applying for an opening within your company. Um, if you're asking about convictions or arrests or charges, you got to say it up front. Don't tell me if it's simple possession of marijuana. I don't want to hear it. Um, otherwise, you could be violating that law. Let's see the next question. I think that's for you, Ann. Okay. Um, someone is using marijuana for sleeping issues, has followed the guidelines to be approved to get this as described in the regulations. The same person is involved in an accident and is drug testing, drug tested. Accident was not related to drug use, but still tested positive. Can this person be terminated if the company policy would include termination with appropriate result, or is this person protected because it's he was taking marijuana to treat a sleeping issue. And that's that's an excellent question, and there is no clear answer at this point. That's going to require some uh, very careful analysis of um, the test results, also really careful analysis of the accident itself, the employee's job position, and um, it communications with the employee and his doctor indirectly through the employee about what the person's disability is, what type of accommodation this person needs, and then you'll have to do analysis over whether or not you can terminate him based simply on the testing positive. So that's that's one of those things we're going to have to be very careful with and watch the law as it develops. Um, and then David posts a question about how has the issue been handled in other states that haven't implemented this previously. And, and that's something that we, um, he, he points out we covered this one. I was going to say that we had several slides on that. Um, I think the next one's for you, Jonathan. Yeah, and I know we're running out of time, so I want to hit those two from Anonymous. The, the first is, what is the expected date for the Cannabis Control Authority uh, will be up and running? Will they begin promulgating regulations? So the, the pending legislation creates the authority July the 1st, and it says that the board has to promulgate regulations to implement uh, the law by July 1st, 2023. They're not allowed to adopt them prior to July 1st, 2022, because they have to be reviewed by the Cannab Cannabis Oversight Commission. So that's the time frame right now. 
uh, for the promulgation of, of the basic regulations. Um, the second question, I am confused. The previous speaker, that would be me, stated that marijuana cannot be prescribed by medical practitioners, yet the suits are showing defendants with prescriptions. In the end, are prescriptions considered valid evidence? I think that's a two-part question, one for you and one for me, Ed. What I was trying to say was, if you look at, for example, in Virginia and other states, they say that the physician recommends or certifies that the person uh, can use therapeutic cannabis. So for example, in Virginia, the, the physician recommends or certifies the use of, of the oils for any particular condition. Um, they're not actually prescribing it like getting a prescription because um, uh, it's still illegal under federal law and doctors prescribe based on their DEA number and the DEA still considers marijuana illegal. So it's the question of the way you word it. So they call it a certification rather than a prescription. And that's what I was that's what I was trying to, to get across. I think the second question, Anne, about the cases with defendants with prescriptions, are they considered valid evidence? I'm, I don't know if that's in the employment context or not, but for the purposes of Virginia, if you possess the uh, cannabidiol oil and you are registered with the Board of Pharmacy and you have that certification from the physician, yes, you, you're legally allowed to possess it. Um, did you have yeah. anything to add on that in the employment context, Anne? Yeah, I think the confusion may have just been um, based on the courts and, um, and their decisions are not always careful in the terminology that they use. Jonathan's description of the definition of prescription is absolutely correct. But sometimes courts and lay people, and I, I may have done this myself, confuse the terms and we'll talk about it being a doctor's prescription for marijuana when it is not, in fact, a prescription. It's actually, as Jonathan said, a certification. But I think that may have been the cause of the confusion that the terms are sometimes used interchangeably um, because of really just people not being careful in what the words actually mean. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's it for the questions, right, Anne? Yep, that's it. Thanks, well, everybody. This has been a lot you. of fun. Yeah, thank you. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you for joining us today. Have Bye. a good day.